Welcome to the Pope on Film. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is... Uh, Reverend Steve, the founder and Pope of the Church of Ed Wood, a pop culture-based internet religion that, unlike a lot of other internet religions out there, and Scientology, uh, it is it actually serious. Because screw Scientology. Oh, there's so much fun, though. I like I like checking up on the Scientologists from time to time and start looking at, seeing if I can find any recent, like, YouTube videos and shit like that. Yeah. There's, there's some great ones out there. I was, I was trolling him really bad on, on um, uh, Twitter for a long time because they yeah. try really hard to fill hashtag Scientology with pro-Scientology stuff, but there's so many people out there who fight them on that. And it's like yeah. half various Scientology Twitter accounts talking about the wonderful things that they're doing, and then half of it are people trying to just expose them for the hideous fraud that they are. But it's important, it's important for people to know that the celebrities get a different version of the Scientology that, like, Lupita walking into a Walmart oh. and see oh. free, like, free personality reading. She gets something mm-hmm. different than what Tom Cruise gets. Well, that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of my overall sort of feeling when it comes to Scientology, except laughing at the bullshit. I like laughing at the bullshit too. But the overall yeah. thing is like, if Tom Cruise wants to pay a hundred thousand dollars so that he can learn to become invisible, bless his little stupid fucking heart. I don't fucking care. It doesn't make yeah. a difference to me. But that they are bilking normal people out of money just like that, just with different steps, you know? You know, like being yeah. an alcoholic, if you, and you're going through the 12 steps. If you, each 12, like, first step, you got to pay us a grand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. The second step is going to be 5,000. You know, the next step after that is going to be 10. You know, and, you know, 25,000, then you'll be getting free. You know, that kind of shit. Yeah. But if, if, if John Travolta wants to learn how to fly, which oddly he did, fine. Who the fuck cares? They got plenty of fucking money. They can borrow this. Well, the church if they want. well I, have, I have three kids, and they're all of varying ages. My youngest is three, and he's at that age where he's really starting to actually pay attention and understand the things he's watching on TV, so no more yeah. showing him, like, offensive things or anything like that. And then I, I, my oldest is about to turn 13, and she's getting to that age where it's like, okay, well, maybe I can sit down and watch this movie that I've been waiting to see with you, and maybe we can watch this horror movie together because you're getting older and stuff like that. But we, we, I try and, you know, there are some things that I will show them and some things that I won't, but I sat them all down and I said, we are watching this South Park episode. It's about Scientology. Everything that's on this episode is 100% true. This is what an actual major religious organization believes, and I want you all to watch this, because this is real. Uh Uh-huh. One of the most important South Park episodes in the history of mankind. Everybody should watch that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I I, 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 parts of it, I don't think I've seen the whole thing. I might have seen the whole thing. It's really wonderful. Everybody didn't that, didn't that even make Isaac Hayes walk off the fucking show before he died? Mm-hmm. Like, he walked off for, I don't know if he walked off for just a little while or he walked off permanently. No, what happened was that they did the Scientology the episode. Yeah. yeah. They did the Scientology episode, and then they all looked, everyone looked at Isaac Hayes, and Isaac Hayes was the, at first cool with it. And he said, hey, you know, these guys make fun of everybody. So, you know, they poke fun at everyone, and I'm okay with that. And then literally maybe like a week later, I guess he got officially reprogrammed, and he walked off the show in disgust because he was so upset that they would, you know, say those lies about his religion. He was definitely... At first, absolutely cool with it, but then he turned this like 
this sudden corner. And so, yeah, he was, he was eventually pissed once he got the right, the proper programming from his overlords. Yeah, 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 and that's, that's just unreal. I mean, I, I, me personally, I would love to grab John, John Travolta by the fucking lapel and be like, dude, it's okay if you like the song, okay? It's okay. <laughs> you know, we've come a long way since Barbarino. It's okay if you like the cock. Just, just get over it and quit this stupid fucking religion. Because they're telling you that if you break the religion, we're going to tell everybody you like the cock. We all know mm-hmm. you like the cock. <laughs> yeah. I, re- I remember you're drinking up a storm in like 2002 and 2003. And I met this guy. Uh, and he he did um like uh, models for movie and he 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 had a he had his own IMDb page and he had a lot of credit and apparently he was also a huge drunk so I would be drinking with him a lot and I remember he would always tell me that like you know who's gay John Travolta and at the time like 2002. 2003, I'm like, what? No way! That's impossible! John Travolta, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's the biggest kept secret in Hollywood. But yeah, like every fifth person who lives in L.A. who works in movies has a John Travolta story. Let me tell you mine. Okay, so I was a PA at the time on, on a Broken Arrow or some movie like that. <laughs> and he's telling me his story and I'm like, this can't be... If he's this, like, out there, then there's no way that anyone could keep this secret. So when the story broke, I it, it, and you know rumors really started spreading about John Travolta yeah. being gay, I was so excited. I was like, "Yay, that drunken guy was right." <laughs> the guy who <laughs> find me all those shots was correct. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. My my last appeal to John Travolta here. Okay, John. I know you're listening. Okay? Now you're listening to the show right now. Okay? Here's my promise to you. If you admit it, if you just come out on television to say, you know, all right, I will personally start the Kickstarter for the gay porn with you and Mickey Wall. Okay? I will do that. I am. I, I support that. I support that. I support that. My name is Reverend Stevens, and I support that message. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked him in the movie Hairspray because he he does a wonderful job in that movie. And the reason why is because he feels so happy to be in drag for a motion picture. He's in drag, and he's singing, and he just it's, it's his greatest performance because he just feels so normal. Apparently, if you really wanted him to act wonderfully, all you had to do was dress him in women's clothing. Yeah. I I haven't gotten around to seeing the remake of Hairspray yet. Um, Hairspray was I one was, of those movies that when it came out, it was like on fucking HBO constantly. And yeah. I really kind of liked it and I really kind of got the kick of it, you know, in a very short time span. But, uh, well, I was okay with the, like, the remake of Hairspray because I never particularly liked the original Hairspray that much. Yeah. So when I realized that, like, oh, well, you know, John Travolta, you know, is so divine. Is this going to be at, going to be accurate to the source material? Oh, wait, the source material was crap. Okay, so I can sit down and watch this and, and have fun with it the same way I did with the, with, unfortunately, with the last Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Which I thought was all right. Yeah. And I still have my own issues with that. I'm eating pizza right now. If my mouth sound, if my voice sounds any strange, it's just because I'm eating a uh, little Caesar's pizza. Just wanted to clear that up to our no listeners worries. out there. No worries. I, I've got orange slices. They might be hearing some of that of me later. Uh, cool. I've got a little Caesar's and some root beer. There you go. Are you going to do a review? um, The root beer that I'm drinking is WBC root beer, Chicago style. 
I don't think oh. that everything can be Chicago style, though. I'm a bit... I, I find it kind of hard to believe, yeah. That's, I that's don't really a bit see Chicago in the, uh, in the root beer making industry. Yeah. And also, I when I was in... Kind of bootleg. When I was in Phoenix, when I was growing up in Phoenix, I would always see, like, ooh, Chicago-style pizza. Ooh, yeah. New York-style pizza. And I always thought, from when I was just the youngest kid, I always thought that if I ever went to those cities, that I would see Phoenix-style pizza. <laughs> and that the, I would go, like, to Chicago, and they'd be like, oh, get your Phoenix-style pizza, and I'd eat it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this tastes just like the pizza I have in my house. Oh, and everybody know, would be like, oh, you eat Phoenix-style pizza? And I'd be like, yeah, I know all about Phoenix-style. Yeah. Growing up, I mean, we would just order, you know, I grew up on Long Island in New York, like 60 miles, 60 miles outside the city, you know, so so we wouldn't order New York pizza, we would order pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would go into a bar, we would order an iced tea, we wouldn't order a Long Island iced tea. <laughs> Hi, can I have a, can I have a here iced tea? Can I have an acai tea? Yeah, and those things took a little while longer to just catch on the rest of the world. Except outside of New York, man, it kind of kills me. I, I can't get a real fucking pizza. Can't get a That's real pizza. That's very annoying. You know, That's... I mean, it's pizza. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, you know. But it's nice, not the nice thin crust, dripping with dripping with cheese, mm. herbs, and a lot of olive oil. Yeah. So that, that fucking piece is just drip, and that thing is just delicious. <laughs> you know. My favorite pizza is, I think it's only in Arizona, but it's a uh, Peter Piper pizza. Yeah. Their commercials would go, Peter Piper Pizza is the pizza people pick. And it was kind of like a, each one, each one was like a low rent Chuck E. Cheese before Chuck E. Cheese came around because there'd be a tiny ball pit and a bunch of arcade games and stuff like that. And, and yeah. the pizza, I love the pizza. And every time I go to Phoenix, I have to get Peter Piper Pizza and it just, it, it tastes wonderful and it tastes like home. But apparently to most people, it tastes like cardboard and styrofoam. Yeah. But to me, it tastes like home because that's the one pizza I would have the most. So so that's like, in my taste buds, that's standard pizza. In the same way that, in my mind, beer is Coors Light. Because that was yeah. all my dad drank. It was the only beer that he ever drank. Maybe like some other Mexican beers, but it would always be Coors Light. So when I got 21, that's all he always gave me, and that's all I drank. And that was just, that is, when I think of beer, it's Coors Light in my head. And well, apparently just that's like, also horrible. See, just like, you know, I, I really think that this is the first experiment in, in food addictives. Just like White Castle. White Castle is not good. Trust me on this, <laughs> on this people. Okay? They're not really that good. Okay? But they are open at 2 in the fucking morning. And I think that has a lot <laughs> part to do with it. Okay? And then on top of it, if a White Castle erupted in my living room right now, I'm getting fucking funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like you've just grown up on this pace and you can recognize, you know, this is, this is shit. <laughs> Yeah, the the dirt bar that I used to go to. Childhood. <laughs> yeah, the dirt bar that I used to go to, um, the Maple Room in Sacramento. Right across the street was a Wiener Schnitzel. Oh. And, and I had never eaten Wiener Schnitzel before, and and I had Wiener Schnitzel a couple of times, and I didn't like Wiener Schnitzel, but but oh yeah, at like midnight or one a.m. 
suddenly that Wiener schnitzel was just the greatest, and they'd stay open until exactly like a half hour after the bar closed or something like that, like like perfect timing, like they knew what was up, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, it, oh yeah, it was like I hated Wiener schnitzel, but man, at one a.m. it was just the absolute best. And then the, the next day you'd be driving past that place and just go, "Oh, that Wiener schnitzel is horrible." What meaner schnitzel? I have to be drunk for that. Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. I imagine that's Taco Bell for most people, but I don't. I I don't know. I imagine that would be Taco Bell for a large portion of of uh of people who drink and then need food. Yeah. See, I I just find the flow of this conversation very interesting because you know. Starts with Scientology, moves on to John Trouble to being gay, and kind of winds up with Wiener Schnitzel. Well, see, that's the charm of our podcast. (laughs) That's the charm of our podcast. We've touched on so many issues, and we haven't even gotten to this week's movie, (laughs) which is amazing. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. I I was having quite a few different thoughts on this one. I watched this. Like, I watched this a couple of times. I watched this a, like a couple of times throughout this week. I, I've tried to watch it and I have heard of it, but I never sat down and watched it. And I was surprised to see that not only is this movie available on YouTube all over the place, but you can also download it for free at the Internet Movie Archive, which is surprising wow. because this is officially the seventh Disney animated feature. Really. Yeah, this is the seventh movie that Disney made. They did Snow White in 1937, and they followed it up with Pinocchio in 1940, and they spent a lot of time and money on that, and it was not as successful as they wanted it to be. And then they put a huge amount of time and money on Fantasia as well, and that also bombed. So they followed that up in 19... 1941 with their fourth animated movie, Dumbo. Dumbo is 61 minutes long. Yeah, there is not a sure single wasted frame. Really it, it, yeah, it's 61 minutes long, but it has three hours of depression in it. Yeah, because there's not a wasted second of that movie because they they knew that after screwing it up with Pinocchio and Fantasia, that there if they were going to do another movie, it had to be quick and cheap and short. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so wonderful about Dumbo. That's an amazing movie. So the fifth animated movie was Bambi. That was the next year in 42. I don't care for that at all. And then uh, they followed... They followed... 1942 was like a, a big year because they they did Bambi. And then in 1943, like shortly after Bambi, the department... The, the U.S. State Department commissioned Walt Disney to go and visit Latin America to garner goodwill and try to make sure that the, you know, all of our neighbors to the south don't go Nazi. So they did a big tour and they turned that into the movie Saludos Amigos, which I'm not even sure if it can be considered a movie because it's only 42 minutes long. But that was so popular that they followed that up with their eighth animated movie which was The Three Caballeros, which I think is one of the weirdest, strangest movies of all time. Mm. And I love it. Is that on the list? That's got to be on the list somewhere. Hey, I don't know if it's on the list. I don't know where. That's a bit of a difficult one to find. It it was released on a DVD with Saludos Amigos because it's kind of sort of a follow-up. But I, I mention it a lot at my story times, the three coming out of us. Whenever we have a Disney story time, I go, kids, what's your favorite Disney movie? And they all say Frozen and some Wreck-It Ralph and some, like, Little Mermaids. And I go, okay, kids, well, let me tell you what my favorite Disney movie is. Um, besides Edward, it's called Three Caballeros. And let me explain to you what it's about. It's about Donald Duck. And he meets two friends from Latin America. One who is constantly smoking a cigar through the entire thing and uh, gets a date for Donald Duck. And then they uh, go to a cockfight and the whole town comes to life and there's a lot of drinking. And then they meet their friend uh, from Mexico 
who is constantly shooting guns in the air and takes the, all three of them on a violently, freakishly psychedelic trip through Mexico on a magic carpet. <laughs> and by this point, the kids are just like, their mouths are dropped. And they have no idea what I'm talking about. And they're kind of scared. And there's one or two parents that are just nodding their head going, yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> yep, that's pretty much it. And I go, kids, seriously, you should watch this if your parents will let you. And they might not because this is weird, but it's from the same people who made Bambi. Mm-hmm. But in between Saludos Amigos and the Three Caballeros, they made the 1943 film, their seventh animated feature film, uh, victory through air power, which it's is three days movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This and is it one was of the a very very special kind of movie. You know, just I mean, there's not much to really uh, synopsize here. It is basically just a Disney war propaganda movie. There's it's, not much else to say about it. It has kind of a documentary sort of a style, you know, and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's, there's something about propaganda, especially, you know, propaganda of World War II and this and, um, like, duck and cover and stuff like that. It just makes me feel really good because it represents a period in time when it was all black and white. Yeah. Not just the the actual visuals, but just, okay, these guys are bad guys, and we're the good guys, and we're going to go kill them. They're trying to kill all the Jews, so they're bad, and we're the good guys, and that's it. Mm -hmm. We're going to go over there and fight them because they're bad. Because I don't think that there was that that existed, like, beyond World War II. You can't say that about the, you know, Vietnam or anything, like, that happened after that time. I don't even think, you know, I don't even think that you can say that about almost any war. I mean, I think the only other fucking possible exception to this would be, like, the Revolutionary War, you know? Because even, mm, you know, everything yeah. else was about some kind of fucked up ideology. I mean, even yeah. the Civil War, you know? Oh, but there's just something great about seeing the World War II propaganda because it's like, okay, well, is this offensive to wars? No, they were killing a bunch of people. So, no, they're the bad guys. Mm-hmm. It's just something that makes me feel just happy about it. <laughs> it's just light propaganda. I really like Duck and Cover. I turn that into a MP3 file, and I play it a lot at home. The kids know yeah. the duck and cover song, which is good because when the bombs start dropping, they'll know what to do. Because <laughs> if a nuclear bomb falls, the only thing that will protect you is a school deck. Yes. That is That's the only deck. thing. Yeah. In the in the duck and cover um, animation, I, I re- well, animation slash live action, I really love, love the boy who pushes the girl right out of the way to get up against the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 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 in the Fuhrer's face, we mentioned that last week, too. The Fuhrer's face, that's a Disney yes. one. Yes, and I forgot to look that one up. No, that's a good one. Yeah. See, what are your feelings on Disney in, in Disney in general, but Disney animated movies and, and, and things of this caliber, what are your feelings on that? Um, I, mean, I, have, I have kids, so I have strong yeah. feelings about Disney animated movies, but... I, I'm trying to revisit them more now in old age, along with a lot of other old weird shit. Um, like what? Uh, well, when we were on our musical kick this other weekend, about a month ago, Jeannie and I had gotten onto a musical kick one weekend, so we just kept flipping through um, musicals on Netflix and shit like that. And we had found a, uh, I forget the fucking name of it, but it was in a Netflix and Cello and Frankie Avalon movie. Nice. You know, that kind of that kind of thing. It wasn't Back um, to the Beach, was it, from the 80s? It, no, no, no. Okay, because I love that. Uh, 
this was with Robert Cummings. Okay. And I can't really, you know, you don't remember those movies. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think that they were created to not. I think they were created to not be remembered. <laughs> yeah. Um, so many of those so, beach so movies for, just. Yeah. Because Disney, I just kind of try to stick to if you know, if a, one of the classics comes on Netflix or something like that, then I'll yeah. stop and give that one another go. But like, I, I don't really think I'm up to watching Robin Hood ever again. Even if it's kind of good, you know, it would have to be. You know, it is pretty good. You know, uh, the the Muppets I revisit. I just watched uh, Muppet Christmas Carol last night. You know? Yeah. You know, well, so I have that's a, I have two I have two girls. Movie. Yeah. So I I I I my kids have gone through various Disney movie phases. When when my girls were very younger, it was all about princesses, and we watched a lot of princess movies. Um, when they got older, they were really into the newer Disney animated films. I've seen a lot of the newer movies that have come out recently. Pretty much every every Disney Pixar movie and and all of the other lame new ones that have come out over the last decade or two. My kids like uh, Meet the Robinsons and Chicken Little and mm-hmm. Lilo and Stitch, which I absolutely hated all of those movies. But Max, my three year old, he is just obsessed with the classics. There was a period in time when he would watch Dumbo once or twice a day. Yeah. Even though he knew it was going to just depress the shit out of him, he still had to watch it. Just, Daddy, I want to watch Dumbo. I want to watch Dumbo fly. And he just, he was obsessed with that. He was obsessed with Fantasia for a while. He still is obsessed over the Three Caballeros. After the Three Caballeros, they they did this kind of fake Fantasia phase. Disney did right. for a while. Because Walt Disney really wanted Fantasia to be like the big thing. And then it bombed. So then, like, in 1944, 45, 46, every time he did a movie, it was essentially like Fantasia in Disguise, but with popular songs and the Andrews Sisters and Roy Rogers and Trigger and stuff like that. So he they did a bunch of, like, fake Fantasia movies, Make Mine Music and Melody Time. My son is obsessed with Melody Time. There's a specific animated little bit in there about uh, Johnny Appleseed, and my son is just obsessed with with Johnny Appleseed and with that cartoon, and he gets an apple, and he's holding it in his hand as he's watching the cartoon, and he <laughs> gets like a pan from the kitchen, and he puts it on his head, and he says, Daddy, look, I'm Johnny Appleseed, <laughs> and he walks around with his apple, and he's just obsessed with that. So my he, my son is really into like the classics. He started watching Pinocchio a lot lately, and I have a like a respect for the classics, which is good. Um, but this movie, I'm surprised that Walt Disney animated movies are big, and especially these classics from like the 30s and 40s and 50s. That these these are considered classics, and these have all been released and re-released and re-re-re-released, and yet the seventh one they made is freely available for you to download on the Internet Movie Archive. Yeah. This it movie came bad. out in... <laughs> yeah. This movie came out in 43, it was re-released in 44, and then there was n- there was no commercial or theatrical release for 60 years. They, the, the Disney vaults, that's the phrase, it went into the Disney vaults. I guess because it's propaganda and it's dated and possibly fairly offensive. I was surprised at how racist this movie wasn't. Um, yeah, they didn't do too much. No. I, it, Mostly because when I... Jacked. Yeah. They like to when, throw that phrase around a lot. Yeah. But when I see... When I see, when I think of propaganda, I think, okay, well, they're going to make, like, these evil, angry German monsters and Japanese people with slanted eyes and big yeah. buck teeth saying offensive things. I was surprised that they didn't go that way. It wasn't really too racist. I'm like, ooh, okay. 
that's not necessarily racist, but still, I mean, it wasn't a slant by an octopus. Oh, 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 that. Or like a yellow oh, octopus. It was just like a normal evil black octopus. And I'm like, hey, good job, Disney. I, I'm sorry, man. No, that made me very happy because I immediately was like, how long before this was Godzilla? <laughs> <laughs> and but then this movie. Being represented by a giant fucking sea monster. That's a good, that's, that's a really good point. <laughs> that's way before uh, Godzilla and uh, the sea monster and everything. The movie was finally officially re-released by Disney in 2014. They released a Disney DVD called, like, Disney Through the War Years. And it, uh-huh. it's it's uh, this collector's edition part of, like, a, I think it's called the Walt Disney Archives or something like that where they were slowly but surely releasing a whole bunch of stuff on the DVD that they'd never released before. And they, it's, I, I owned that for a small period of time. Like I borrowed it from a friend for like two or three years. And so my kids and I would just constantly watch it. And it's just every bit of propaganda that the Disney company made during World War II. And it's just amazing. And you see Donald go, like a enlist in the army and his problems in the army, and you see Goofy learning how to be a sailor, and it's the history of sailing. But of course, it ends with him destroying the, the very racist seeming Japanese people. Yeah, and it's a, it's an amazing DVD. And with that was there the official release of Victory Through Air Power. Uh, like 60 years after it came out. I'm surprised so I, it took yeah, that I, long. So we had that one, we had that one graphic where, you know, because it's taking out parts where they're actually talking about war strategy and things like that, which is like, this is a kind of intense subject matter. You know? I mean, you're, you're kind of telling people war plans. You know? Um, but then there was the one part where, the, where, um, Vlad the Impaler was trying to explain how, um, Nazi Germany was kind of centralized in a hub. Okay. And nice swastika in the background, you know, red field, you know, big circles, folks coming out. And then the Americans were all these little green arrows. That came out of everywhere and start poking this fucking thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm getting a really different fucking message all of a sudden here. <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to, we're trying to penetrate Hitler's egg? <laughs> nice. <laughs> really? The beginning is the beginning of the movie, it starts out just remarkably childish. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because, like, the first There's 20 or 30 minutes... The childishness. Yeah. The first, like, 25 minutes is a fun, comedic, slapsticky look at the history of animation. Mm-hmm. And, and it's surprising that, like, it's, oh, yes, let's look at the Wright brothers, and, uh, oh... Is that a crash? Oh, tee hee. Look at this funny slapstick. Now, let's show and, the and dead Wilbur, bodies Wilbur in had Norway. Back. Yeah. On that historic flight, Wilbur had back. Okay? Yes. There was the deceased yes. ass drawn there as he clung on the wing of the plane. <laughs> yeah. You know. One of the things that this movie made me realize about myself is that I apparently don't know uh, I apparently know jack shit about World War Two. Really? Wait, well, I I know like the bullet points. I know the things that apparently I needed to know in order to pass various history classes. Mm-hmm. But when they're talking about the Blitzkrieg, I'm like, okay, I know World War Two. What do I know about the Blitzkrieg? Okay, I know that the Blitzkrieg. Raged and the body stank, and also let me please introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. 
And that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And then it's like Dunkirk. Okay, what do I know about Dunkirk? Okay, well, I know that apparently the word Dunkirk is highly flammable. Because it's on fire on the screen, so I know that, okay, if you're near a sign that says Dunkirk, don't be smoking or anything like that, because it'll just instantly burst into flame. But they did but that same they, kind of thing throughout the movie, because yeah. when they first put up the word war, it is an amazing piece of artwork, huge yeah. block letters war in red on that fucking background. And when they put up peace, it was all muted gray, <laughs> white background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they played around with that kind of stuff a lot. How often did you find yourself thinking of Pink Floyd, though? A lot. A lot. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of, like, uh, the hammers looking imagery going on in this movie. Yeah, a lot of, uh, there were, Parts where the animation just started getting off the fucking hook. Was, yeah, holy there was, shit! The, the devastation was that stuff. they were showing from the bombings were like, wow. <laughs> yeah, this is How definitely a skillfully made. Yeah, yeah. This, is a, this is a beautiful movie. It is quite beautiful. Some of the battle scenes that they show are just absolutely amazing when they're. The, the animation that they did yeah. with it. I should mention, I should mention that this movie is based on a book, a 1942 book called Victory Through Air Power, which was written by Major Alexander de Seversky, Vlad the Impaler, a.k.a. Vlad the Impaler, who also, I believe, his hair was made entirely out of styrofoam. Yes, he was. And and he was so bland, my brain started superimposing different things, different images over him, you know? For, for like one yeah. scene while he was talking, he was a, uh, like a medieval French dandy, you know, where I pictured his face completely powdered white, in a long curly brown wig in that outfit. It's funny because I'll say his voice is his voice sometimes to me it sounded sometimes like a Russian person doing a bad Bela Lugosi impression. And then when I would think of that, I would think maybe this is like the grandfather of Justine Bateman's character from last week's film. <laughs> the death artist. Because he's, he, his voice, there's just something about his voice where it's like, if I didn't know, if I like, if I didn't go to Wikipedia and find out like his life story, then I swear that he's doing some sort of really bad fake accent. Yeah. <laughs> like when I was in, when I was, I went to college and I took a class and it was uh, the history and culture of Japan. That was the class okay. I took. It was the history and culture of Japan, and I said, I will take this class. And it was this big, huge class. There were like 100 people in it, and the professor came, and it was a sh- very short Asian man, and he had the thickest glasses on, and he had the worst, most stereotypical at like uh, Japanese accent of that yeah. anyone has ever had. Like a just just picture like a like a fifth grade boy making fun of a Japanese person and that was this man's voice. It was so stereotypically bad that I I became fascinated because on that first day in class, I'd say about seventy five to eighty percent of the class thought he was doing a bit. <laughs> It, like, like they thought they were being punked, or like, like, it, like this was some sort of like Andy Kaufman, like a serious art shit going on. And at the end, mm-hmm. the teacher was just gonna take off the glasses and go like, "You ought to be ashamed of yourself, thinking that I was that 
stereotypical Asian character. You need to learn more about Asian culture. I'll see you next week. When, but instead, he when, just, like, I, literally, you could hear people laughing and giggling and, you know, waiting for him to stop. And then, when, then, because it, it, the first, it, it was like a two-hour-long class that happened once a week. And then slowly but surely, people realized that this wasn't an act and that he wasn't going to take off his glasses and speak normally. <laughs> which also meant that you couldn't understand about 60% of what he was saying. So slowly but surely, about half the class walked out on this poor, poor guy. <laughs> I stayed I stayed to the end and ended up getting a C by magic because I could not understand what this guy said. He could barely write on the chalkboard. He was yeah. old and you, you just could not understand a word he was saying. Oh man, that first class, people were just waiting. People were just waiting that it was actually going to be like, like, like Captain Sulu. And he was just, welcome to class! Welcome to class! Welcome! Just kidding, kids. <laughs> it was actually me. Like he, like so, Major Alexander de Saversky. If I didn't know that he was this Russian-born immigrant guy, then I would have sworn that that was just a, like a like a fake accent. Yeah, yeah. Like he was essentially here. he was doing moose and squirrel is what he was doing. That was yeah. the voice he had. You can almost hear John Malkovich saying, "I could do that." <laughs> <laughs> but the the. the Opening scene, you know, the first scene that we see him in, my God, that was the best. Although there, there were other classic movie, movie moments and other scenes with him. But he's sitting behind that fucking desk, and you're looking, you know, at least I'm looking. And I'm like, okay, this is really kind of kind of typical and stuff. Um, he's in an office. He's supposed to be smart, so there are all these books. And then I'm looking a little harder, and I'm like, they got curtains that look like books. <laughs> <laughs> Those aren't books at all. Those are the window curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and then he trying him positive is so that everybody sees the picture of his wife, so he could just be like, mm-hmm, half of that, uh-huh. Yeah, right there, right there, in the back, in the back, you know. Yes. Flat hair, black and white. Yeah. That's fine, I'm having that. Hey, baby, my, my girl comes so early. Huh? Okay. Well, I am, I'm podcasting, so I'll be along in a bit. Okay, baby? Love you. Okay. Aww. My girlfriend is starting to come home early now, and it kind of took me by surprise for the first time. So, gotcha. Uh, okay. So, um, this so movie was nominated doing? for an Oscar. We'll finish the show. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it was so obvious, so that everybody would look at the picture of his wife. You know. Uh huh. So that that was just the, his opening, and then it's right on top of it. It's like, why are we listening to this fine guy? You know, I I would not have expected that they would put a foreign person as lead narrator, regardless of how important he may be. Yeah, in a movie like this. Yeah. And I felt the same way, so I wanted to find out more information about this guy. So I went to his Wikipedia page, and I'm like, okay, let me read about this guy. But, oh, you know, my God, I couldn't read his, I could not read his Wikipedia page. It was just like, it was, it was like, like a, like reading a textbook, like I could not get through it. It was just difficult to read. I mean, I'm not trying to, like, be, like, racist about this or anything else, or at least not much, but... I would think like John Wayne would have been a better choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you would. No, it's surprising. Kind of... It's surprising that Walt Disney would make a movie and have like as like the, one of the.
one of the main characters in the film, whether it's a documentary in real life, it's surprising that Walt Disney, of all people, would have this, like, Russian-born, like, immigrant right there mm-hmm. front and center in the movie. But apparently, reading his Wikipedia page, I, I skimmed through it and discovered a few things. Number one, he had a, a wooden leg. So one of his legs is wooden. So I kept, okay. like, the second time I watched the movie, I was trying to look for any sort of limp, but I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. And also, apparently, when he wrote the book, it was such a huge bestseller that he became like a like a celebrity. And he ended up marrying some wealthy American socialite woman and would be in the paper and stuff. So I'm not sure if this movie was made before or after he became a celebrity. Yeah. But I think this movie may have come out like around the period in time when he was getting in in like the front page of the paper and and Uh stuff like that. Because the book came out a year before the movie was made. And the book was apparently like this huge, massive bestseller. And essentially, this movie is based on the book, and the book is essentially based on the theory that um, planes are important. Yes. <laughs> it, that the I, I guess the theory of the film is that you, we should focus on long-range bomber planes and stop focusing on land and sea. I guess. That would be the theory. Yes, I, I, I could, I could see how you would walk away with that. Yes, it's just, it's just difficult because <laughs> it's just difficult because you're watching this movie and it's like, okay, so you're trying to tell me that planes are important. Is that yeah? Is that what you're? But, but think about this too, okay? There's something that's going to be running in theaters, a Walt Disney movie, and all that kind of shit. You know. It's it's almost like you're trying to sell the budget for the planes to the American people. Yeah. You know, and like that's where the real propaganda is. Is that is that who are we trying to convince that this war is bad and we should fight it? Yeah. You know. Well, we're trying to convince the people who are going to wind up spending the money for the fucking planes and shit. Yeah. I, I have a, a story that I wanted to tell about this movie okay. that, I, that I just remembered that I had to tell. So we get a random assortment of television stations. We don't have a cable. Right. And we just have, like, you know, whatever the, the TV stations are that we can get. But there are no TV stations in our town or antennas or anything like that. I mean, we're a very small town. So we get whatever TV stations we that that reach us from Oklahoma City, and it will change. Like we'll get TBS for like eight hours, and then we'll lose it for like two days, and then we'll get it again. So we get a random assortment of TV stations, and some of the ones that we get are pretty amazing. Like we get a station that shows nothing but twenty four seven country music videos. It's Country music videos. Oh, God, yeah. 24-7 country music videos. I heard a song about two weeks ago. It, sometimes I stop because it's, it's just comedy gold. There was a song that played called I'm Getting Drunk on a Plane. Okay. And I'm like, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm getting drunk on a plane. It's my new favorite country song. Right up there with You're Wanted by the Police and My Wife Thinks You're Dead. That's my Junior Brown from the 90s, and it's still my favorite country song. But um, there's there's two different CBS stations that we get. One is just the regular CBS station. That's channel 9.1. But channel 9.2 will keep replaying whatever the last news broadcast the regular CBS station plays over and over again. Oh. So at noon, they will play a half, they, they do a half hour of news, and there's no more news until 6, so they'll keep replaying that half hour on 9.2 over and over again. Oh, I find that. And we get five stations of Christian uh, of programming. Okay, I got occasionally. a quick pop in there. <laughs> well, one of the times is nothing but Christian 
programming for kids. And it's yeah. just, oh, it's the most amazing thing in the world. All the puppets are just horrible. And it, oh, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. I, I love this. I, I love it. But one of the stations that, oh, oh right. it, it, tell, tell your Christian story. What was your Christian station story? Oh, no, it's not a Christian station story, but uh, me and my wife were moving to Colorado from uh, New York. Huh? And we're driving through Kansas, okay? Mm. And we okay. start running out res- at a reception on radio stations. So I'm kind of cruising around to find a decent radio station to listen to. And I get to this one station, and they're playing um, rock and roll fantasy, okay? They're playing okay. bad, uh, bad cup. Cool. I'm like, okay, this should be a pretty good station. Let me listen to this. And then that gets followed up by Joan Jett's uh, I Love Rock and Roll. And then it gets followed up by, by the Scorpions. Oh, my God, I can't think of the name of the song, but I think you, you know where Wind I'm going here already. Um, okay. No, it was whatever it was that had rock and roll in the title. <laughs> okay. Whatever Scorpion song. And then uh, it played the John Cougar song, you know? And I'm like, all right, this is kind of fucked up. But, you know, we are in Kansas. Okay? Yeah. And then they do a quick radio identification. And then they play the next song, which is Bad Company again. Hmm. Then they played Joan Jett. <laughs> then they played the Scorpions. They had four fucking songs on a continual loop that all had rock in the title. Really? <laughs> so I listened to really? it for like an hour and a half to my in disbelief. <laughs> that is amazing. One of our stations, one of our stations that, that we got for the, for like the last five days, there's been this, this weird thing going on where they're playing programming. They're playing nothing but reruns, but n- not only are they shows that they've played before, they're playing reruns of whole days of broadcasting, including commercials. And there's a small scroll on the there's a small scroll on the bottom of the of the station, and I've never seen this before. But it says regular programming will commence on like December thirteenth, two thousand fourteen, at five p.m. Be sure to contact the the companies uh, whose commercials you see who might be doing deals to make sure that the deals are still going on. You were watching a rerun of a previous day's broadcast. I've never seen anyone do that before. Oh, man. Like, there's, like you, you, you're freaked out because it's like December whatever, and this one station is still showing Black Friday commercials. Like, mm-hmm. well, Black Friday is two weeks away. And we're already starting our deals now with they're liter- they're rerunning a whole day. <laughs> and I've never seen anything like that happen before. Like the T V stations here are just weird. Really weird like that. And there's one station, um Antenna T V. And it shows yeah. nothing yeah. but reruns. Yeah. Like uh, like the reruns that Nick and Knight used to show. So a lot of I Dream of Jeannie and Three's Company, My Three Sons, Dennis the Menace, Slipper. Right. My kids watched Gidget and really liked it. Um, yeah. And some really old movies. But they have this thing called Totally Tuned In on Saturday morning. And it's nothing but the oldest cartoons. In the yeah. world, like Mr. Magoo and like uh, Gerald McBoing Boing and all of these really old, outdated cartoons from a really long time ago. And my kids like to watch it. And I was watching one cartoon it, out of the corner of my eye because my kids were really watching it. But in the credits for the cartoon, they listed 
a writer by the name of T. He. The letter T, period, and the last name was H E E. And I and I and I saw that, and I go, oh, that guy's name is T. He. That's got to be fake. And then I forgot about it, and that must have been like about four months ago. And I completely yeah. forgot about the person named T. He until. I watched Victory Through Air Power because he was one of the writers. Really? Yeah. Uh, one of the credits is a uh, first story adaptation. The first name on that is is T. He again. So I'm like, okay, well, I have to find out what the hell this T. He thing is. I thought that maybe it was like a Alan Smithy. Like maybe right. T. He was the name that like someone who worked on an animated cartoon would give. But no. It turns out his name was Thornton He, and he was from Oklahoma, but I I haven't figured out exactly where from Oklahoma, but apparently Thornton He is from Oklahoma. He started work in the in the early 30s at the Le- at Leon Schlesinger Productions, which eventually turned into WB, the Warner Brothers Animation Studio. Right. But in 1937, he joined Disney. He ended up directing a, a part of Fantasia and he helped write Victory Through Air Power and he worked with Disney for a while throughout the, the, the 40s and he left in the 50s and started working with a bunch of other companies, the United Pictures Animation and Terry Toon throughout the 50s and 60s and then he died in the 70s. But TV, TV yeah, yeah, I'm having a, write this. I, I just keep thinking about how TV has written a an American propaganda war movie. Yes, he he. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he. and he's from Oklahoma, so that makes me feel um nothing because I'm not from here. Makes me feel absolutely nothing. <laughs> it was it, it almost made me feel something, and then I lost it. I just completely lost it. I was really uh, close would, though. I would guess awkward and uncomfortable might be the feeling. <laughs> Maybe. It's weird because, like, Oklahoma... So, there's there's OU, and that's the University of Oklahoma. And then there's OSU, and apparently that's uh, the, the college in Tulsa. And one time a year, these two teams will fight each other in football, and that happened okay. over this last weekend, and essentially, it's like Christmas, but just for Oklahoma. Oh, okay. It was really weird. It was really weird, because it literally, like, I had two people call and go, are you guys going to be open during the game? Yes. Okay, so a, how how many? Yes, it's how a many Saturday. Years, how many years have you been there now? Uh, three. Three. Okay. Well, so by in this time, if they suddenly all started screaming, festival, festival, you you would have you would have found out by now, right? Yeah, I I'm I'm still just surprised that that college football is so important. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something bad about Oklahoma. the The city I live in is is uh, Shawnee, Shawnee, Oklahoma. Right. There are about seven elementary schools in this city, but there is one junior high school, and there is one yeah. high school. The junior high school and the high school aren't huge high schools. They're about the size of one of the elementary schools. But you would think that if everyone was graduating, that there would need to be an equal amount of these schools, right? Wouldn't well, I need think more than think, one junior high school, more than one high school. I think they might be processing the younger ones as real. That's a possibility. That's that's what leads to my mind. You know, you just don't need as many of them anymore. You know, and like then my once youngest, they get past a certain age, and they get kind of tough, and you know, so you let them go to junior high. Like my youngest daughter, she doesn't 
read too much. She likes reading a little bit, but yeah, she's 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 apparently Stephen King compared to everyone else in her class. Yeah, like she's Stephen Hawking. That's that's good. She's a Stephen Hawking compared to everyone else in her class. It's a bit odd. He's like a a, a really smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hate the musical Oklahoma. I'll say that right now. I hate the musical yeah. Oklahoma. Now, Guys and Dolls. I like Guys and Dolls. And Sweeney yeah. Todd. But not couldn't, Oklahoma. Couldn't find, couldn't find Oklahoma. We we started with um, we started with The Nightmare Before Christmas. That's kind of what kicked it off. And then we went on to the Pirate of Penzance. And mm. Yeah, and I keep wondering why we um, think Kevin Klein is straight. <laughs> he's a, he's another one. He's kind of in the John Travolta category. Although I think if he was gay, he would tell us. He he just looks at his eyes. He's like, fuck yeah. He, he did make that gay movie. Uh, uh, in and out wasn't that wasn't yeah. He made a gay movie. Kevin Klein. Yeah. Yeah, oh. it was called it was called In and Out. It was in like the the nineties. He played like a like a straight man trying to come out, and there was a wedding of some sort. It was directed by Frank Oz, the former puppeteer. I remember oh. there being like a a fake stink about it when it first came out. But yeah, oh, no, it was a, he, uh, ring a bell. It wasn't that memorable. I just <laughs> vaguely remember there being some sort of a think about it when it first came out. Yeah, and I remember seeing it going like, okay, he's playing a really like over the top stereotype of what is considered to be a gay person. Should I be offended at this? Yeah, just like like I would have been offended, but then. That would have been too much effort for the stupid movie, so I'll just watch it and then forget about it. But yeah, that was Kevin Klein. The, the, the one thing, tell me if you noticed this about Vlad, okay? Okay. Whereas everything. Like the people who make the trash bags? I know, Vlad, the narrator of our show. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas everything really was kind of low key throughout the thing. Didn't Vlad sometimes come off like he was having a really hard time maintaining? You know, that's funny. He, he was that's just funny like because cranking up slowly and being like, "We tried to tell them about air power, but they wanted to do things the old way." <laughs> that's funny that you mentioned that. I thought you were saying Vlad, like Vlad the trash bags, but you're saying Vlad, like the yeah. narrator for the movie. I watched the when I first watched this I, I I rented from the library the Disney D V D version. And the Disney D V D version from that box that they did Disney through the Warriors, it it has a special introduction by Leonard Malton. And he talked about the movie for he talked about the movie for about ten minutes before the movie actually starts and he specifically says that um the narrator guy had the hardest time doing doing all of his scenes. And he, <laughs> he, he had a hard time speaking English. He had a hard time remembering his lines. He had a hard time walking because of his uh, wooden leg. And he just he would, like, break down and say, I can't, I, you want me to, to, to remember my lines? You want me to say them properly? You want me to move to my marks? to get to the camera and get to the right lighting. How do you expect me to do all this? And the director got him to be a better actor by saying, well, okay, well, you're a, you're a pilot. Do you just do one thing or do you have to be checking the altimeter? Do you have to be checking the fuel gauge? Do you have to be checking this? Do you have to be checking that? This is essentially the same thing. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, he had a hard time doing this. And also, apparently, they had to film the movie at night because um, apparently 
they filmed all of his scenes right next to Lockheed Airport, and you just constantly be hearing the, the airplanes and stuff. Oh, okay. So, not only was he having a hard time doing all this, but he was doing it probably at like 3 a.m. So, yeah, he definitely had a hard time doing this, poor guy. Mm-hmm. I, I feel a lot more educated about supply routes. Yes, you know? yes, I, I do, too. I feel pretty good about supply routes. And, you know, I understand how supply routes work now, and, you know, if there's a pop quiz tomorrow about it, I, I'm, I'm ready. You know. Yeah. I now finally I now finally realize that airplanes are important. Airplanes, as it turns out, are pretty important. Yeah, here I am, you know, building trenches. Mm-hmm. But apparently those are just passe, you know. Hitler and I wish you're just gonna I was busy building a giant wooden rabbit. Interesting, interesting. I thought that, you know, if I'm going to be attacked here in Oklahoma, it's obviously going to be from the sea. So I've been building a lot of battleships. <laughs> but apparently there are these things called airplanes that are new. They're new. Yeah. They're the new. Like, I really did think that, like, Watching this movie, that's like, I know that it's 1942, but you guys can't seriously be thinking, what, we should use more airplanes? <laughs> like, here's this Russian guy going, I have an idea. What if we make <laughs> planes that can fly longer? <laughs> and then Walt Disney's like, great, I'm going to make an animated movie about that. We should make planes that can fly longer. Why didn't mm-hmm. anyone think of this? Mm-hmm. Well, you, but you know, you, 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 the movie. You pitch an idea like that at Walt, you know, and the, you run, you start running into the problem of like, you know, yeah, we'll make movies of planes that fly longer, and the one plane lost its father. Yeah, <laughs> so that plane is really sad, and he's got to fly over into Nazi territory, and the other planes, they make fun of him because they know he can't really do it, except for this, this group of black planes who have a magical feather. Or at least And then you would have to plane. just grab him like, Walt, no, Walt, Walt, come back to it, Walt. So the there's a specific Simpsons that I there's a specific Simpsons episode that I always think of every time my son wants to watch Dumbo and Lisa yeah. says it, Lisa says wait a second so you're saying that that he's Dumbo and you're the mouse what does that make us the racist crows and Homer puts his arm around Lisa and says oh come on Lisa. Those crows weren't racist. The animators who created them were. <laughs> and I think of that every single solitary time. It's like, okay, well, sure, cartoons are no longer racist, but I swear every other animated movie to this day still has to have a wise-talking black sidekick. Animated yeah. character, like every single solitary one. Like when I I saw it, I was forced to see Mulan, and I'm like, Eddie Murphy is a wise talking dragon. That's offensive. People are gonna get upset about that. And then he followed that up with a wise talking black donkey, which I felt was even more offensive. But then everyone loved that. Well, well. It, and I even think it came up in the election, but it's a, it, it's an actual movie term and has been for a while that, you know, blah, 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 you're casting the Magic Negro. Yeah, yeah. And the Magic Negro would be like Will Smith in uh, The Legend of Beggar Vance, Morgan Freeman in almost everything he's fucking done. Yeah. The 
woman who played Mother Abigail in this band, all of that, you you would some movies you gotta have the magic negro. The Truvius in the Lego movie. Did you see the Lego yeah. movie? It was cute. I, I have not seen the Lego movie now. It's a cute movie. It hasn't hit Netflix yet. <laughs> it's it's pretty darn cute. That's that's one of my new criteria for certain movies. Like, yeah, I'll watch that when it gets on Netflix. You know, yeah. I'm not going to go out to see it. Like Dark Shadows. You know, I haven't seen it. I'm not planning on seeing it. When it pops up on Netflix, I'll probably check it out. Yeah, you're not missing too much with Dark Shadow. That that was that movie was a bit of a shame. It's a good movie. It's a good, cute, fun movie. If you have never seen or heard of the television show Dark Shadow, it it did, well well okay. So I was a big Dark Shadow fan. Okay. Yeah. If you not see this movie, then do not see this movie. It'll just crush your heart. I'm I'm not bothered that it's a parody or anything like that, okay? I'm fine with that. But it doesn't look like the kind of parody that has the love of its subject matter that, like, Shaun of the Dead had or Galaxy yeah. Quest had, you know, yeah. where it's, yes, this is, this is a parody, but you can tell that the people who are making this fucking love the shit you're talking about and making fun of. Galaxy you know? Quest was Galaxy Quest was a few years ago one hundred percent officially voted the number seventh greatest Star Trek movie ever made. Yeah. Yeah. They had a vote at some Star Trek convention to see like which movies were the best movies. And I think um I think uh, The Wrath of Khan was number one. But seventh was Galaxy Quest. So Galaxy Quest is a better movie than uh, than Star Trek than, than that one where Data died. Whatever that one was. The one where that Data one. died? Wasn't yeah. That one <laughs> it was whatever the last uh, whatever the last one was before the reboot. Yeah. I don't remember what it was called because it was horrible. I I got really tired with the Star Trek movies where, uh, and frankly, Next Generation too, because like every movie they would crash the Enterprise, they give you a new uh-huh. fucking Enterprise, then you fucking crash that one. Do you people know how to fly a fucking starship? And then yeah. I got really tired with Data because like every other episode, some entity was taking over Data. Mm-hmm. And making them do nasty things to the ship. You know, I, I felt like at that point I would have to be like, Data, Data, buddy, come here. Come here, I gotta talk to you. Okay? We're friends and all, and I love you, and everything's cool, but you're really a menace to the ship, and I, I gotta kill you now. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you really should put up a firewall or something. <laughs> you would think this is the future, you would have better virus protection. There's a book that you should read. Um, they're turning it into like a, a, a either a TV show or a made-for-TV miniseries. I think it might be a mini miniseries, but it's a yeah. wonderful book, and it's called Red Shirt. Red Shirt, okay. Red Shirt's all one word, and it's all about this crew up in space. And they keep getting into adventures, and this new ensign is sent to work on this ship, and he's working in the background, but he keeps getting sent to these important missions, and something's wrong with the ship, and finally the wonderful scene happens where, where like, this one doctor guy says, like, okay, I've got, I've got bad news, and I've got worse news. The bad news is, and you're not going to believe me, but this is true. We are based, our entire existence seems to be based on an old science fiction show. It's like, oh, 
you're right, we don't believe you. It's like, well, I've got worse news. I don't think the show was that good. <laughs> so, it's like, there's a whole yeah. group of people who are on this ship who have, who have made it their mission to be, like, a to not be important. Because if they're important, then they might get dragged into the actual plot, and then they might get killed. Oh. It's, it, it's, it's really it's really quite amazing. Now, so then, like, so, so then, like every, so then, like every other Star Trek episode, they go into a wormhole and they go back in time and find the actual show, which is loosely based on Star Trek. It, yeah. it, 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 it's, it really is a cute, weird, funny little little book. But for someone who loved the original Star Trek and somewhat Star Trek The Next Generation, and not too much else after that, it really, it really is a wonderful book. But now the universe constant, is constantly expanding, okay, as opposed to at one point physically going to contract. If it's constantly expanding, then there are infinite possibilities, and everything happens multiple times. This is kind of the multiverse idea, more or less, which means that even in fiction, those people actually, right now, exist out there somewhere. Yeah. I okay, read that's all you some... have to say to that. That's all you well, have no, to say I, to I that. read some... Yep. <laughs> I read some science magazine, I think it was Discovery Magazine, and they had something similar to that where all around us constantly there exists an infinite amount of of us, but an infinite amount of different events happening to us. Like right now right. I'm gonna scratch my leg, but then there's like one of me who doesn't scratch my leg, there's one who does scratch my leg but then does something different. Then we are constantly surrounded by an infinite amount of us that's doing different things. But right, we can't and see each them time because we're stuck it. in our own Yeah. Yeah. And each so time I always you do a different thing, it sprouts off a se- off a separate universe. Yeah. So that's why yeah, I always freak out when line. I'm almost in an accident. Like, if I'm driving yeah. and I'm like, oh, my God, that guy almost crashed into me, then I feel bad because it's like, oh, well, there's a me who has done that. Yeah. Like, oh, I almost I almost hit that guy. Oh, God, there's a me who kills that man. <laughs> oh, God, there's a me who kills that man and then just speeds away. And and uh, it haunts him for the rest of his life. There's someone Do who you- kills there's someone who thinks he have... kills that guy, but then that guy is actually still alive and then hunts me down and kills me like in a horror movie. And I say, so I always feel bad when something almost happens because I know that somewhere out there, there's a me who actually does have to deal with that shit. <laughs> Do you have a five minute story, a good five minute story? Because I need a break. A five minute story? Huh? Sure, I will tell a five-minute story. Where you are talking to yourself for about five minutes, and I'll be back. To yes, the can. yes, I can absolutely, I can absolutely do that. Yes, you go and you go and do what you need to do, and I will tell it. my five-minute story. Go for it. Okay. Um, so there was this one time where I was doing this thing, and uh, I need help with this. Uh, Bella, come with me. 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 No, you, you guys watch your movie. You guys can do your thing. Uh, okay. So, I'm supposed to fill five minutes while Bonnie, my uh, co-host, goes off and does something. And I can't think of a story to tell. So I'm going to turn things over to my youngest daughter, Isabella, who's going to tell us all about her day at school. Isabella. Welcome to the podcast, my nine-year-old daughter, Isabella. Isabella. Hey. Okay. Hello. That's it? That's all you have to say is hello. That's it? Nothing else? Hello. Let me think. 
Uh, okay, well, here, let me help you out. I, this is a podcast about movies, okay? So, what is your favorite movie? What movie do you really like to watch and watch over and over again? What movie do you really, really like? Why don't you talk about a movie you like, Bella? Maleficent. Um, really? You picked Maleficent? That's yeah. surprising. Do you really like that movie with Angelina Jolie? Yeah, I do. What do you like about it? Well, I like how when Maleficent was a young girl, she had wings, but she, um, but she accidentally, like, lost them, but, but she got them back at the end of the movie, and then she was good again. Okay, that, that's what, that's what we adults call a spoiler alert there, Bella. Because <laughs> you just gave away the ending, but that's okay. Um, I, I am now joined, I am now joined by my young three-year-old son, Maxwell, who is, uh, trying to, I, yes, I know it's my only son, thank you for clarifying that, Bella, who is brandishing a weapon at me. Maxwell, come here. Do you want to be on my podcast? Okay, then come here then. And be on my podcast. A plethora of special guests. Max, will say hi, podcast. Hi, podcast. That's very cute. Did you say I love you to my podcast? Yeah. Okay. Say I love you, podcast. I love you, podcast. That is very sweet. Thank you, Maxwell. Maxwell, what is your favorite movie? Do you like Ninja Turtles? What movie do you like? What movie do you really like? Maxwell is three, so his favorite movie is Caligula. Caligula. Um, it's a touching story about a young farm boy in space, and it, he gets he he ends up in this X-wing fighter. And going, he's flying through the Death Star. He's like trying to aim for the hole and like almost there, almost there. And Darth Vader's his father. Isn't that weird? That's Caligula, but with more boobs. Oh, that's the perfect point to come back to. <laughs> I didn't have a story, so I just brought my kids in here. And we were talking about Caligula. The first words you hear, and that's Caligula. (laughs) (laughs) Well, these kids need to know the importance. The important. Yeah, important part of movie history there. I told I told my kids that Caligula is is essentially Star Wars but with more boobs. Star Wars with more boobs. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's essentially Caligula. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can kind of see that. Yeah. So, Victory Through Air Power is a wonderful film, and everyone should see it, because it's totally free, despite being the seventh Disney animated movie that they ever created. It, it is a very bizarre movie. There are There are definitely touches of Pink Floyd going on there. Yes, yes, very much so. And it's like this movie's just gotten trippy for some strange reason. And then, and then you keep getting blindsided by. You're watching a cute cartoon. It gets cutesy. It's you know they're throwing rocks at each other from the plane. You know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Vlad Mr. Serious comes popping up, and you're not sure if he's going to snap or not. And then they then they start showing you animations of of military movements and things like that, and then it starts going into a cute animation again. Yeah, it really seemed to not make up its mind over what type of a movie it wanted to be. Yeah, I was a little disappointed that Donald Duck wasn't in it. Yes, well, obviously. Donald Duck was too busy um, getting 
drunk in Mexico at that time. <laughs> There's in between Saludos Donald Amigos and... Donald was contractually obligated to another project. <laughs> yeah. He was too busy getting wasted in Bahia to <laughs> care at all about what was going on with World War II. Well, it's an amazing yeah, film. Victory through air power. Oh, my God, it is something to see. It is something to see. And he wasn't too heavy-handed with the propaganda. It was definitely there. You know, I it was certainly a USA rah-rah movie. You know. It came off it came off less as propaganda and more as here's a history lesson. Yeah. Here's what has happened so far in World War II. Let's let's just take you through what has happened here. But there was also a, a heavy feeling of we've got to do it. We've got to build these planes where they're going to come over here and they're going to kill us all. Yeah. You know, that was not missing at all. That was definitely there. I learned a lot of things. I learned not to rely too heavily on the island of Crete. Oh, why aren't they pussies? Oh, my God. Yeah. Damn. Yes. Damn. Crete. Cretians. Yeah. Damn Cretites. It is. I learned. Um, yeah. I learned that it's apparently really easy to invade France. You just have to be really quick and surprise them. Mm-hmm. And just run up to them and just surprise them. And then they just get scared. Why I learned not to invest it... in trenches. Yes. Why did it, exactly why did it come, take them so long to come up with, hey, Alaska? Yeah, right? Wouldn't that have been like your first fucking thought? It would be like, that's American soil. It wasn't a state yet, but it was still American soil. We can go launch from here, fly safely through fucking Russia. I don't know, maybe they were just thinking like, we can't go over there. It's cold. <laughs> it's close to Russia, and it would be it would be a, a tactical advantage. But I'd have to buy a really thick jacket. <laughs> so I guess that's and, out. And Crete is so nice this time of year. It is. You know. It is very nice at this time of year. Crete is. I guess. I mean, it's no, it's no Bahia, but it's still pretty nice. Yeah, but you know, the, the, the olive trees are starting to blossom and things like that. I mean, I know it's a war and everything, but a, you know, a couple of creature comforts ain't gonna hurt us. Yeah. yeah. Ah, Bahia. The land of the little surrender monkeys get their fucking island blown to shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bastards. Cretans? Cretanites? Cretanites? Uh, Cretonians? I like Cretonians. I'm going to go with Cretonians. Cretonians has a very this islander feel to it. Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the star of this islander is did he have his lines dubbed, or was his voice literally just like negative four in the bass? Because whenever I see the Silent Earth, I'm always struck by the hero's voice just, Where the Momo Poop? <laughs> Ruth. I don't know, but I, I could see them artificially. I do not trust that alien scum. Like, really seriously, like, ridiculous. I would not put them past overdubbing his voice. I don't know if they did or not, but if they did, I've I would taken, I've taken his wait a moment to just be one of my uh, random catchphrases that I say if I'm a little bit confused or if I don't like something. I go, wait a moment. <laughs> wait a moment. Ruth. 
Have you had any good Ooh. band names lately? Have I had any good what? Band names. Oh, I, I, I probably get about five or ten a day, but I just instantly forget them. Uh-huh. I instantly forget them. Because I guess I kind of need musical talent before I start a band. Well, you know what, never mind. That hasn't stopped some people. No, no, it hasn't. And God bless mm-hmm. their little hearts, too. You know, yeah. just saying. Her sex pistols were essentially just sneezing into equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess I you know, can... Never, never quit, never surrender. You know. Yeah, that's, that's what I gotta do. <laughs> but yeah, eventually, eventually I'll, I'll come across a name that I really want to stick with. Yeah. So what should we do next week? Next week. Uh, well, what are some of the things on the list? Um, well, this may come as a shock to you, considering the fact that I am who I am. But I, I came to the realization the other day that I've never seen the movie Carnival of Souls. That comes as a shock. Yeah, everyone has constantly told me about how wonderful of a movie it is, and I think I've maybe tried tried to see it once or twice, like an Elvira version or something like that, but I've never sat down and just watched it all the way through. I've never done that. And if I have, I was drunk, and I don't remember it at all. Yeah. It's one of those where I say that you you definitely should, um, yet it's still not worth the hype it gets. <laughs> awesome. You know, it, it 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 gets the hype kind of in the same Night of the Living Dead sort of a way where it fell into the public domain so it was on all the fucking time. You know, that kind of a thing. It's yeah. not bad. It's got its moments. You know, but I would rather save all that for the actual show. <laughs> yeah. You know, because there are some definite thoughts I have there on that movie. So, yeah. All right. That's one in the running. Cool. Um, you just want to go, you just want to go and book that? We could do that, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, let's do that. That'd be awesome. I, I've always wanted to have, like, a reason to sit down and watch that movie. Cool. So next week, Carnival of Souls. Sweet. I'm down with that. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's wrap it up so I can go say hi to my girlfriend and we can spend some time together. Okay. 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 We'll do that. We'll do that next week. And, uh, you can find us at, on Facebook, Pope on Film. Just do a search for Pope on Film and you'll find our Facebook page there. Uh, you can email us at Pope at Undead Cow Film. You can find us in the iTunes store. Uh, the best way of searching that is Undead Cow Space Pope on Film. And that, that'll that bring up everything that I'm actually putting out. Um, and you can also get us on YouTube at Undead Cow Films on YouTube. But you can watch us over there. And don't forget our Stitcher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's on my list of things to do, man. <laughs> Don't forget our Stitcher. Look at Stitcher and find out what the fuck it is and what it's doing. <laughs> yes. Find out what Stitcher is and then tell us. Yeah. Hey, if anybody knows what Stitcher is, tell us on our Facebook page. <laughs> or email us at what and what our email is. Oh, our email, pope at undeadcow.com. There you go. I knew it was that. I was just testing it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got of him this week? Um, what do I have to pimp this week? Um, I guess my bitches. Okay. You know, just okay. just just my hoes. You know, my my tricks. Are they working? Are they particular this weekend? Huh? 
Well, if somebody wanted to catch up with you, bitches, where would they need to go? Um, 12th Street and Van Buren in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where I'll be with my with my hoes. Because oh, I'm man. from the streets. I am from the hardcore streets of uh-huh. Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> hardcore streets. Mm-hmm. Hardcore gold paved streets. <laughs> But oh oh okay, well, here's something to here's something to pimp. I have been doing story times once or sometimes twice a week nonstop for the last twelve years. And I have a Facebook page for my story times and yes, it, inexplicably you do. inexplicably it has gotten over hundred and thirty likes. So nice. Find my story time page. Uh, search story times with story time with Mr. Steve. Story time, all one word. There's actually two Facebook pages. One has about 20 likes, and it's from when I was in California. Don't pay attention to that one. It's the one with 130 likes and very strange pictures of me in my pajamas. That's the one to like. <laughs> I punch a, I, I post a bunch of pictures. From story times and my story times are the weirdest things in the world. So even if you're never going to come to my story time, find my Facebook page and like it. It's a whole bunch of fun, a crazy amount of fun to see the weird ass stuff that I'm doing with these kids. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Boba Fett. Yes. I, I just finished, uh, I did a How the Grinch Stole Christmas story time and I was really proud that I came up with the fact that the Grinch hates the Who's. He hates Finn. He especially hates Pinball Wizard. He just hates that song. <laughs> really never got into Tommy that much, but he hates the Who's. He hates the Rolling Stones. He hates the Beatles. I mean, Zeppelin's fine because, of course, Zeppelin. But especially the Who's. Especially Pete Townsend. Especially the kids are like the kids have no idea what I'm talking about, and I'm just laughing my ass off. I'm like, kids, sometimes Mr. Steve tells jokes for Mr. Steve. Sometimes it's for me. It's not all about you, little kid. Sometimes it's about me. So yeah, all of that stuff's on the Facebook page. So be sure and look for me on Facebook. Story time with Mr. Steve. It's pretty crazy. Oh, just so that advertising makes it worth dropping by. Come on. Yeah. No, it's 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 pretty it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna have to get off and go look that up. I like my Boba Fett costume. I've got a flash costume. I've got a full body flash costume that I keep meaning to do, but I'm trying to figure out number one how to make it not creepy and give people nightmares. And number two, how to not show off my junk so much in it. Uh huh. Because it's a full body, like skin tied outfit, like one of those green man outfits, you know, where you just like have to like shove yourself into that thing. Yeah. So, but, I want to you, wear the outfit, but I don't want to like labyrinth. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to like freak people out like David Bowie in labyrinth. I don't want to like be showing off all of my stuff. Yeah. Hold on, Maxwell. Hold on, Maxwell wants to say something to the podcast. Yeah, you're right. Thank you, Maxwell. You you. heard it from a three-year-old. The podcast is nice. (laughs) We're gonna have to put up some quotes. Uh huh. We're gonna have to actually put up. Yes. <laughs> All right, then. For this week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. And see you next week. God Carnival Lord. of Souls. Carnival of Souls. <laughs> and possibly... Next one. Oh, See you later, heathens. 